Today I'm kind of concluding our my sermon series kind of on uh, Christians living in exile, our studies in First Peter. And uh, as I, I want to share something that I shared with our session on Wednesday, that sometimes God's way of picking leaders is a lot different than the world's way. Here's a good example. To Jesus, son of Nazareth, woodcrafter, carpenter shop, Nazareth, from Jordan Management Consultants, Jerusalem. Dear Sir, thank you for submitting the resumes of the 12 men you have picked for management positions in your new organization. All of them have now taken ba our batteries of tests. We have not only run the results through our computer, but also arranged personal interviews with, for each of them with our psychologist and vocational aptitude consultant. It is the staff opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background, education, and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise you are undertaking. They do not have the team concept. We would recommend that you continue your search for persons of experience in managerial ability and proven capability. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, place personal interest above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine morale. We feel it is better our duty to tell you that Matthew has been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Bureau, Better Business Bureau. James, son of Ephesus, and Thaddeus definitely have radical leanings, and they both registered a high score on the manic depressive scale. One of the candidates shows great potential. He is a man of ability and resourcefulness, meets people well, has a keen business mind, and has contacts in high places. He is highly motivated, ambitious, and responsible. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your controller and right-hand man. All of the other profiles are self-explanatory. We wish you every success in your new venture. Sincerely yours, jo Jordan Management Consultants. Sometimes we forget that God picks people because of what he wants to do in their life than what they can do necessarily for him. And sometimes we as leaders and people can easily forget what is most important in life. In 1985, the great baseball pitcher, Tom Seaver, was on the verge of winning his 300th Major League Baseball game, which few pitchers have done. He went over to his nine-year-old daughter in the box seats and said to her excitedly, three more outs to go. She responded, good, then we can go home and go swimming. <laughs> Children who love us just because we are their parents is important when we try to think that our children love us for what we maybe have accomplished in life. Or God thinks that he is interested in what we can accomplish for him in life. I believe God can use a time of exile for the church to help the church re-examine their priorities about what is really important in life. That is why Peter says that those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their Creator and continue to do good. I believe Peter is saying that we don't always know God's plan in life. In exile, the church once was in a position of influence in society, can now feel as if God has abandoned them with these large buildings that sit pretty empty. Peter is stressing that God has not abandoned the church. And the church needs to seek God's will once again and continue to do good even though we are suffering and trust God with the results. 
Let me give you an example. Who knows where the largest Presbyterian church in the world is? Anyone? Korea. Very good. In Seoul, Korea. Myung Sung, I hope I pronounced that properly, Presbyterian Church in Seoul, Korea, has 100,000 members in their church. As of 2006, Myung Sung Mission Department has been able to support 56 nations through 92 families and 172 missionaries. Myung Sung Church also supports small churches, schools, hospitals, community centers, and future leaders. In 1890, a Presbyterian by the name of James Gale went to Korea as a missionary. James Gale didn't have the amazing results that Myung Sung Church has today. His wife and family had to leave the country after a short stay with tuberculosis. He didn't live long enough to see the fruit of his labor and working for the Korean people to know Jesus. He was very talented. There was nothing wrong with that. His influence was great. Although he was often, often frustrated by the rivalries and the jealousies and personality clashes that too often characterized the missionary community in Korea, his linguistic skills were essential in the work of Bible translation, while his literary and poetic sensitivity gave his writing an added charm. He was unable to even publish a considerable portion of what he wrote or translated, and much remains to be published in his papers in the University of Toronto. But this is what he did. He translated parts of the Gospel of Matthew, Ephesians, and the Book of Acts. And he worked on one of the first Korean English dictionaries. <coughs> He also was the translator of the first work of Western literature to be printed in the Korean script, Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. When I talk to many Christian leaders of Korean descent today, many of them are so thankful for the influence of the early missionaries like James Gale, who lived the love of Jesus without ever seeing the fruit of that service. The Christian church has always been built by many humble servants willing to serve God. Peter himself addresses the church leaders in this passage as he calls himself a fellow elder. In the first verse of the book, letter, he calls himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. The word apostle has that authority to it. But in this chapter, Peter chooses to identify with the fellow followers of Jesus as an elder. Now Peter calls himself a witness to the sufferings of Jesus. We all know how that went for Peter, don't we? Remember, Peter was the follower of Jesus who stood by his side right through his death on the cross. Wrong. Peter denied knowing Jesus three times during the time when Jesus needed that support the most. Peter, in sharing himself as a witness of Jesus, is humbling himself to the church to remind the church of how great the grace of God is in our lives. That Peter would say that he chose me to be a leader. But Peter also wants to remind the church of the glory that will be given to the church, the fruit that will come from our service to the Lord. In chapter 1, verse 3, Peter reminds 
us that in God's great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. The follower of Jesus, just as Jesus was resurrected from death, the ultimate result of suffering, is it not? So too the believer will experience resurrection through God's power into an inheritance that can never spoil, perish, or fade. The Church of Christ is not in exile forever. The followers of Jesus will be in heaven with Christ forever. Peter speaks of this inheritance again in verse 4 by saying that those who serve Christ will receive from the chief shepherd, Jesus, a crown of glory that will never fade away. It's amazing when you reflect upon it. Jesus is crowned with glory and honor, and he is going to share his glory with us. The crown in this passage, according to Wayne Grudem, is the type of crown given to a soldier or a general for a victory. Probably like our Victoria Cross. See, I did learn something from my citizenship class. <laughs> or the U.S. Congressional Medal of Honor. Peter stresses, though, in the meantime, as we wait for this reward, we must continue to serve those under our care. Not because we must or for financial gain, but as examples of the chief shepherd who calls us in his mercy and grace. If I could summarize Peter's teaching in verses 5 through 7, I would summarize that God is calling leaders in the church to be humble servants to each other. The best visual biblical example was when Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Jesus challenged his future church leaders to wash one another's feet in service. Andrew Murray calls humility the place of entire dependence on God, where all we see that all we have is a gift from God even each other. Stuart Scott describes how Christian humility is lived out in our lives. When someone is humble, they are focused on God and others, not self. Even their focus on others is, a desire, is out of a desire to love and glorify God. A humble person's goal is to elevate God and to glorify Him in encouraging others. In short, they no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 15. If I were to take this bowl of water here and come down and want to wash your feet this morning, I think we might have a mass exodus out of the church building pretty quickly. But yet, when we serve each other in the name of Jesus, out of desire to love and glorify God, it is as if Jesus is coming down through us and washing our feet. Jesus has washed me through his grace, is what Peter experienced as a witness to the suffering Jesus went through on the cross. Remember that story of the foot washing. It was Peter who said to Jesus, I don't want you to wash my feet. And Jesus responded, unless I wash you, Peter, you have no part with me. A Christian leader never forgets how we never get to a place in life where we don't need to be washed by Jesus. It takes humility, doesn't it, to admit we're in dependence for, on God for everything. But Peter wants to remind us that God opposes the proud people, 
and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, he says, therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Peter knows that we carry many anxieties and cares through this life, and these anxieties and cares are too strong for us to carry on ourselves, by ourselves. Humble servants know that we are too weak in our own strength to make it, and we need to cast off, literally means to throw off our anxieties and our cares on the Lord. A Christian, a strong Christian, is one who in humility quickly goes to God in prayer with all their anxieties and cares. Like a little child who raises up their arms to Papa and says, help. A.B. Bruce once observed, the whole aim of satanic policy is to get self-interest recognized as the chief end of mankind, humankind. Peter encourages Christians to resist the devil in the way of resisting our self-interest being the chief goal in life. As you know, God's glory should be our chief end. We glorify him by serving him with true humility in light of his gracious gifts to us. As humble servants, we wash each other's feet in the name of Jesus. May we always remember, though, the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory, that when we do suffer a little while, will himself restore us and make us strong, firm, and steadfast, because he has the power to do that for the church forever and ever. Amen. For our prayer time, I'm going to do something a little different again. I hope you're getting used to me doing something that's a little different. Um, I'm going to, we're going to practice that casting our cares and our anxieties on the Lord as a church. I'm going to bring the cross down here onto this stand. And I have little red pieces of yarn. And if you don't need to say your name or anything or whatever, but if you would like me to place one of these around the cross as symbolic of a care or concern in our world or something that you're carrying that you or some, for someone else, we'll, I'll tie it around the cross as a symbol of our prayer of casting our cares and our anxieties onto Jesus.